Chapter 5, Seven Day Walk, April 1975 The first sight I see when I open my eyes the next morning is the glum, upside-down face of Jew against the background of cloudy skies as she tugs at my hair. Wake up! We have to move again, she tells me. Slowly I sit up and rub the seeds out of my sleepy eyes. All around me, a sea of people wake, babies cry, old people groan, pots and pans clang against the sides of wagons whose wheels grind the dirt beneath them. There are many more people than the numbers I know to count them with. My eyes follow Koi and Meng as they walk into the temple with big silver pots to fetch water. Kev says there is always a well near a temple. Moments later, Koi and Meng return, visibly shaken with their empty pots. We went into the temple but found no monks there, only a Khmer Rouge soldier, they tell Pa. They yelled at us to stay away from the temple well. We stopped and came back, but other people went in anyway. Koi's words are interrupted by the sound of gunshots coming from inside the temple. Hurriedly, we pack our belongings and leave the area. Later on, we hear the Khmer Rouge soldiers had killed two people inside the temple and wounded many more. Today, our third day on the road, I walk with a little more bounce in my steps. In Phnom Penh, the soldiers had said we could return home after three days. The soldiers told us we had to leave because the United States was going to bomb our city. But I have not seen any planes in the sky and have heard no bombs dropped. It is strange to me that they made us leave just so we can turn back and go home after three days. I smile at the silly picture of us marching like ant black ants coming to a stop at the end of the day only to head back home. I do not understand, but I guess three days is how long it takes for them to clean the city. Pa, will we go home soon? The soldier said we can return home after three days. I tug at Pa's pants. It is afternoon and we are not even slowing down yet. Maybe, but meanwhile, we have to walk. But, Pa, this is the third day. Are we going to turn around and walk back home now? No, we have to keep walking, Pa says sadly. Reluctantly, I do what Pa tells me. Everybody has to carry something, so I pick the smallest item in the pile, the rice pot. As I walk, the pot becomes heavier and heavier in my hands as the sun climbs higher and higher in the sky. The metal handle digs and burns the palms of my hands. Sometimes I carry it with two hands in front of me, other times I switch the pot from my right to my left arm, but it seems no matter how I carry the pot, carry it, the pot painfully bangs into some part of my leg. It is evening now, and I am losing hope that we can go home tonight. Tired and hungry, I drag my feet, taking smaller and smaller steps until I'm far behind everyone else. Pa, I'm very hungry and my feet hurt, I yell at him. You can't eat now. We have very little food left, and we need to ration it because we have a long way to go. I don't know why we have to save it, I stand still in the road, letting go of the rice pot to wipe dirt and tears from my cheeks. Our three days will soon be over. We can return home. Let's just go home. I want to go home. The words somehow come out between halting sobs. My 40-pound body refuses to walk anymore. The red dust from the road and the sweat on my body have mixed to create a layer of mud on my skin, making it dry and itchy. Paul walks over to Kev and takes a ball of sticky rice out of the pot she is carrying. He comes over to me and hands me the food. My eyes look down at the ground in shame, but I take the food from him anyway. Silently, he strokes my hair while I eat my rice between choking sobs. Bending down, Paul looks me in the eyes and says softly, They lie. The soldiers lie. We cannot go home tonight. His words make me sob harder. But they said three days. I know. I'm sorry you believe them, but they lied. I don't understand why they lied. My voice quivers as I say it. I don't know either, but they lied to us. My hopes crushed, I wipe my forearm across my nose, dragging snot all over my cheek. Pa gently cleans my face with his hand and then takes the rice pot from me and says I only have to carry it myself for the rest of the trip. With Gek on her hip, Ma walks over to me and wraps my scarf around my head to protect me from the sun. I wish that I were a little baby like Gek. She doesn't have to walk at all. Ma carries her in her arms all day. I am miserable, but at least I have shoes. Some of the people walk barefoot in the scorching heat, carrying their life's belongings on their backs or head. I feel sorry for them, knowing they are worse off than I am. And no matter how far we go, there are always more people along the way. When night falls, once again we make the road our home and sleep, along with hundreds of thousands of other families fe fleeing Phnom Penh. Our fourth day on the road starts the same as all the other days. Are we there yet? I keep asking Kim. When I receive no attention, I proceed to sniff and cry. Nobody cares about me, I moan and keep walking anyway. 
By noontime, we reached the Khmer Rouge military checkpoint in the town of Kambal. The checkpoint consists of no more than a few small makeshift tents with trucks parked beside them. There are many soldiers at this base, and it is easy to recognize them because they wear identical loose-fitting black pajama pants and shirts. All carry identical guns slung across their backs. They move quickly from place to place with fingers on the triggers of their weapons, pacing back and forth in front of the crowd, yelling instructions into a bullhorn. This is Kambal Base. You are not allowed to pass until we have cleared you. Stand with your family in a line. Our comrade soldiers will come and ask a few simple questions. You are to answer them truthfully and not lie to the Yankar. If you lie to the Yankar, we will find out. The Yankar is all-knowing and has eyes and ears everywhere. This is the first time I hear the word Yankar, which means the organization. Pa says the Yankar is the new government of Cambodia. He tells us that in the past, Prince Sihanouk ruled Cambodia as a monarch. Then, in 1970, and happy with the prince's government, General Law Nol deposed him in a military coup. The Law Nol democratic government has been fighting a civil war with the communist Khmer Rouge ever since. Now the Khmer Rouge has won the war, and its government is called the Ankar. To your right, you see a table where your comrade brothers sit waiting to help you. Anyone who has worked for the deposed government, ex-soldiers or politicians, step up to the table to register for work. The Ankar needs you right away. Anxiety spreads through my body at the sight of the Khmer soldiers. I feel like I have to vomit. Pa quickly gathers our family and stands us in line with other peasant families. Remember, we are a family of peasants. Give them whatever they want and don't argue. Don't say anything. Let me do all the talking. Don't go anywhere. And don't make any moves until I tell you to do so, Pa instructs us firmly. Standing in line, wedged amongst many people, my nostrils are assaulted by the stale smell of bodies that have not been washed for many days. To filter the smell, I pull the scarf tightly over my nose and mouth. In front of us, the line splits into two as a large group of ex-soldiers, government workers, and former politicians walk over to the table to register for work. My heart pounds quickly against my chest, but I say nothing and lean against Pa's legs. He reaches down and puts his hand on top of my head. It stays there as if protecting me from the sun and the soldiers. After a few minutes, my head feels cooler and my heartbeat slows. Ahead of us in line, Khmer Rouge soldiers yell something to the crowd, but I cannot hear what they say. Then, one Khmer Rouge soldier roughly jerks a bag off one man's shoulder and dumps its contents on the ground. From this pile, a Khmer Rouge soldier picks up an old Lan Nol army uniform. The Khmer Rouge soldier sneers at the man and pushes him to another Khmer Rouge soldier standing beside him. The soldier then moves on to the next family, eyes downcast, shoulders slumped, arms hanging loosely on both sides of him. The man with the Lan Nol uniform in his bag does not fight as another Khmer Rouge soldier points and pushes him away with the butt of his rifle. After many hours, it is finally our time to be questioned. I can tell we've been standing here a long time because the sun now warms my lower back instead of the top of my head. As a Khmer Rouge soldier approaches us, my stomach twists into tight knots. I lean closer to Pa and reach out for his hand. Pa's hand is much too big for mine, so I am only able to wrap my fingers around his index finger. What do you do? the soldier curtly asked Pa. I work as a packer in the shipping port. What do you do? The soldier points his finger at Ma. Her eyes focus on the ground, and she shifts Gek's weight on her hip. I sell old clothes in the market, she says in a barely audible voice. The soldier rummages through all our bags one by one. Then he bends down and lifts the lid of the rice pot next to Pa's feet. Gripping Pa's finger even tighter, my heart races as the soldier checks the pot. His face is close to mine. I concentrate on my dirty toes. I dare not look into his face, for I have been told that when you look into their eyes, you can see the devil himself. All right, you are cleared. You may go. Thank you, comrade, Pa says meekly, his head bobbing up and down to the soldier. The soldier is already looking past Pa, merely waves his hand for us to hurry on. Passing the checkpoint safely, we walk a few more hours until the sun goes to sleep behind the mountains and the world becomes a place of shadows and shapes once again. In the mass of people, Pa finds us a spot of unoccupied grass near the side of the road. Ma puts Gek down next to me and tells me to keep an eye on her. Sitting next to her, I am struck by how pale she looks. Breathing quietly, she fights to keep her eyelids open, but in the end, she loses and falls to sleep. Her growling stomach talks, to, talks as mine grumbles in return. Knowing there will be nothing to eat for a while, I lie down on a small bundle of clothes next to her and rest my head on another. Quickly, I too fall asleep. When I wake, I am sitting upright on the straw mat and Kev is pushing food into my mouth. 
Eat this, she says. Rice balls with wild mushrooms. Koi and Mang pick the mushrooms in the woods. With my eyes still closed, the rice ball works itself slowly down my dry throat and quiets my hunger. After I finish my small portion, I lie back down and leave the world of the Khmer Rouge soldiers behind. In the middle of the night, I dream I am in a New Year's parade. The Cambodian Lunar New Year this year falls on the 13th of April. Traditionally, for three days and nights, we celebrate the New Year with parades, food, and music. In my dream, fireworks crackle and boom noisily, rejoicing in the New Year celebration. There are many varieties of food on the table, red cookies, red candles, red roasted pigs, and red noodles. Everything is red. I am even wearing a new red dress that Ma has made for the special occasion. In the Chinese culture, it is not proper for girls to wear this color because it attracts too much attention. Only girls who want attention wear red, and they are generally viewed as bad and improper, more than likely from a bad family. But New Year's is a special occasion, and during the celebration, everyone is allowed to wear red. Ju is next to me, clapping her hands at something. Gek is giggling and trying to catch up with me as I run and spin around and around. We all have on the same dress. We look so pretty with red ribbons in our ponytails, red rouge on our cheeks, and red lipstick on our lips. My sisters and I hold hands, laughing as fireworks boom in the background. I wake up the next morning to the voices of my brothers and father, whispering to each other about what went on in the night. Pa, Meng says in a frightened voice, a man told me the noise last night was the Khmer Rouge soldier opening fire on all the people who registered for work. They killed every one of them. Their words push at my temples, making my head throb with fear. Don't say anything. If the soldiers hear us, we will be in danger. Hearing this makes me afraid, and I walk over to Pa. We've been walking and walking for five da days now. Can we go home? Don't talk anymore, he whispers, and hands me over to Kev. Kev takes my hand and leads me to the woods so I can go to the bathroom. We've only taken a few steps when Koi stops us. Turn and walk back. Don't go any farther, he yells. She has to go. There's a dead body in the tall grass, only a few feet from where you are. That's why the spot was left empty last night. I grip Kev's hand tighter and suddenly notice a smell that hits my nostrils. It is not the smell of rotten grass or my own body odor, but a smell so putrid that my stomach coils. A smell similar to that of rotten chicken innards left out on the hot sun for too many days. Everything surrounding me becomes blurry, and I do not hear Kev telling me to move my legs. I hear only the buzzing of flies feasting on the human corpse. I feel Kev's hands pull at me, and my feet automatically move in her direction. With my hand in hers, we catch up with the rest of the family and begin our sixth day of marching. On our walk, the soldiers are everywhere, prodding us along. They point and give us directions with their guns and bullhorns. In the scorching April heat, many older people become ill from heat stroke and dehydration, but they dare not rest. When someone falls ill, the family throws out his belongings, puts the sick person on someone's back or a wagon if the family is lucky enough to have one, and march on. We walk on through the morning and afternoon, stopping for food and to rest only when the sun goes down. All around us, other families have also stopped to rest for the night. Some stagger into the field, picking up firewood to cook their meals. Others eat what they cooked earlier and fall asleep as soon as they lie down. We walk around the curled up bodies to find an empty area of our own. Exhausted, Ma and Kev struggle to set up our resting spot and start a fire. From one of the plastic bags we carry our remaining belongings in, Kev takes out a bedsheet and spreads it on the ground. Ma unrolls the straw mat and lines it up next to the bedsheets. While I sit with Gek on small bundles, rubbing my burned and aching, ach aching ankles, Ju and Kim move our other bags onto the bedsheet. Holding her hand, I attempt to lead Gek to sit on the sheets, but she pulls out of my hand and toddles over to Pa. He picks her up and holds her to his chest. Her face, brown and blistered from the sun, rests at the nape of his neck as his body swivels left and right. Before long, she is asleep. Our food supply is reduced to only a few pounds of rice, so Meng, Koi, and Kim have to forage for other food to supplement the rice. They walk half a mile to the nearby town of Ong Snur snur and return an hour later their figures move toward us slowly kim carries an armful of dry wood and in ming's hand is a small branch piercing two small fish and some wild vegetables koi walks towards us with a small pot and an ecstatic grin on his face ma look he calls to her barely able to contain his glee sugar <gasps> brown sugar ma exclaims taking the pot away from him 
though I am tired, those two words bring me running in the direction of the pot. Brown sugar, I repeat quietly. I never knew how two little words could bring me so much happiness. Ma, let me have a taste. There's almost a quarter of a pot of it. Shh, don't say it so loud, Kev warns me. Other people will come and beg us for some. I notice a few of our neighbors look in our direction. Here, everyone, have a small taste. We have to save some, Ma says as we gather around. My siblings stick their fingers into the sugar and lick what they are able to pull out. Me, 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 I beg Ma as she slowly lowers the pot to my level. I know it is my only chance to get as much sugar as I can, so I wait a few seconds to form enough spit in my mouth. Then I make my finger in my then I put my finger in my mouth and swish the spit around my finger to make sure I wet every millimeter of my finger. When I am satisfied that my finger is wet enough, I take it out of my mouth and slowly roll it around on top of the sugar. My finger rolls so slowly that I can feel the rough grains bonding to it. When I pull it out of the pot, I am happy to see what I have achieved. I have more sugar on my one finger than anyone else does. Carefully, I place my other hand under my treasure to catch any grains that might fall from my finger. Slowly, I walk my finger back to my spot on the mat and begin to eat each grain of the sugar. After dinner, Ma takes us girls to a nearby pond, which is already crowded with people washing their clothes and naked children, tentatively putting their heads under the muddy water. The children all look too tired to bop up and down, laugh, or splash at one another. Ma instructs us to strip off our clothes. I remove my brown shirt, a shirt that was yellow when I hurriedly dressed six days ago. Naked, Ju, Gek, and I wait while Ma removes her clothes from under her sarong and hands them over to Kev. With no soap, Kev takes the clothes to the edge of the river and scrubs them against the rocks to get them clean. With Gek balanced on one of her hips, Ma takes my hand and walks Ju and I into the pond for our first wash in six days. Hand in hand, we stop when the water reaches my waist. The water feels cool and soft on my skin, slowly peeling away the layers of grime that has collected. The slippery grass in the water sways back and forth to the rhythm of our movements, gently brushing against my legs. Some of the blades slither around my ankles, sending chills up and down my spine. I jump and fall into the water, pulling Jew with me, who is still holding on tight to Ma's hand. When I resurface, they are all laughing at me. I am happy to have all of us laughing together again. In the morning, Ma wakes everyone, and we get ready for our seventh day of walking. The road ahead of us shimmers in the heat, and the dust swells as everywhere, burning my eyes. In the distance, my eyes focus on a lone bicyclist. I cannot tell how tall he is, only that he is very thin. It is strange that he is traveling against the flow of traffic. All of a sudden, I am startled by Ma's scream. Between loud, halting sobs, Ma managed to say, It's your Uncle Liang! With our hands in the air and bodies jumping up and down, we wave excitedly to our uncle. Uncle Liang waves one hand back and pedals his bike faster in our direction. He comes to a stop a few feet from us, and all at once we rush toward him. <clears throat> Blinking his eyes, he takes Ma into his arms, with Pa standing quietly beside them. All the worries and fears of the past few days are now over, for at last he has found his sister. Uncle Liang hands Ma a package from the his front bike rack, and while she opens the cans of tuna and other food, he tells Pa that this morning other people from Phnom Penh arrived in his village. The new arrivals told him of the evacuation and how the King Rouge forced everyone to leave all the cities, including Phnom Penh, Bansambang, and Siem Reap. Hearing this, he got on his bike and has been looking for us all morning. He then shares with us the glorious news that Ma's oldest brother, Hiang, is on his way to pick us up in a wagon. A smile of joy crosses over my face, knowing I will not have to walk any more and that in a few days we can ride in their wagon home. Standing next to Uncle Liang, I have to tilt my head back as far as I can to see his face because he is so tall. Even then, all I can see is the shape of his thin lips and wide black nostrils that flare every once every few seconds as he talks to Ma. At almost six feet tall, second Uncle Kim Liang hovers above us all. His long, thin arms and legs make him look like a stick figure, like I used to draw on my school books. Uncle Liang lives in a village called Krang Troop. Both Uncle Liang and Uncle Hiang have lived in the countryside since before the revolution and have never lived in a city. The Khmer Rouge considers them uncorrupted model citizens for their new society. Pa says that we will go and live with our uncles in their village. 
The wagon, pulled by two yellow skinny cows moving very slowly, arrives later that evening. While Pa and Ma talk to my uncle, I quickly claim a seat in the wagon with Jew and Get. Our trail takes us on a gravel road along Route 26 westward until we reach the Khmer Rouge occupied village of Bat Dang. No matter where we go or in which direction we turn, there are people marching ahead and behind us. In the midst of the crowd, our wagon passes the Khmer Rouge village without stopping. We veer restward, leaving our roadside companions far behind. Somewhere between Bat Dang and Krang Troop, I fall asleep.